Kevin, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Kevin was nice in what he said about me, so I won't say anything bad about him. <laughs> Man, I can't tell you how great it is to know Kevin and to have had the relationship that we've had, my family has had with his family over the last few years. <clears throat> excuse me. It's been wonderful to know him and, and to be able to come and work with some of the congregations that he's worked with. We got to take teenagers from Hot Springs, Arkansas, up to Bolivar, Missouri, where he preached before. And we got to spend time with Kevin and Sherry and the kids and watch the kids grow up and uh, work with, with some of the folks there in Bolivar. So it's awesome now to, to be able to come here to Sebring and to be with you guys this week. And I am so very excited to be here. Uh, we're doing a series in Abilene right now. Uh, entitled The Simple Truth, the same series that we're going to be doing uh, here in Sebring this week, and just taking a look at some of the things of Scripture that I think that people make too complicated, more complicated than it has to be. There are certainly things in Scripture that are hard to understand, aren't they? Peter says about Paul's writings that there's some things that Paul writes that are difficult to understand. Now, I'd argue that there are some things that Peter writes that are difficult to understand as well. There are things all throughout Scripture that are difficult to understand, but sometimes we make them more complicated than they have to be. Sometimes I think that we do that in order to create loopholes for ourselves, right? You know, and, and if we twist it this way or we twist it that way, in fact, that's what Peter's talking about in 2 Peter when he says that about Paul's letters, that some people twist the scriptures to their own destruction. They pervert what is said. And we make a complicated mess out of God's word, leaving many of us to, to wonder, what does it mean? What's it all about? And, and sometimes we feel like, I can't understand Scripture. It's too far above me. It's too complicated for me. And I think that's a shame. Because God's Word was written for and by ordinary, everyday followers of His, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so I think that God's Word is written so that we can understand it. Peter said that it was difficult to understand at times, but not impossible to understand. And I think that if we, if we understand what it is first. If we understand a simple framework, then we can really understand what uh, all the, the parts of it are all about. So I want to open it up for discussion for just a few minutes. I appreciate that, brother. What a nice guy. He's <laughs> being so nice. I don't know how to take it. Um, let, let's kind of open it up for just a, just a minute, and, and let's talk about books in general. What, what genres or what types of books are out there. What, what, th there's different types of books, right? Not every book is the same kind of a book. So let's leave scripture aside for just a second and we'll come back to that. But as far as other books are concerned, what other kind of books are out there? What, what, what genres of books are there? Romance, okay, romance books. History books. I'm sorry? Biographical, both autobiographies and biographies written by others. Mysteries, fantasies, biblical history, yeah, absolutely. Sci-fi, yeah. Commentaries, okay, so there's all kinds of different books, right? There's, there's books that are more of a reference type, like commentaries, things that, that uh, are, are encyclopedias or dictionaries. I mean, that's not the kind of thing you read for fun, right? I mean, you don't sit down and maybe, maybe you do, I don't know, the thesaurus, you know, learn a new word of the day, I don't know. But, uh, but, but there's reference books, dictionaries, the thors, thesauruses, uh, encyclopedias, commentaries that, that are used like a reference book. There are books that are novels. Fiction books, there are non-fiction books, historical, we mentioned a few of those. And so, but, but let, me, let me ask you this, what would happen if you read, say, a, a novel, and you read it like a reference book? If you, if you took the latest novel that, that, that's on the, the, the shelves of the bookstore, and you, you, you thought that it was, you were confused about the genre that it was, and you pulled it off the shelf and you used it like a reference book, what would happen? You'd be led astray. You'd be very confused. Yeah, I'd be, it would be a complicated mess, right? I mean, how do you use this? Where's the table of context? You know, content. Where, how, how do you use this book? And, and then if you, if you thought that the things inside of it were true because you thought that it was a reference book, well, you, like somebody said, you'd be led astray, right? You, you'd, be, you'd be confused about what reality was because you're thinking... This doesn't make any sense. Or the other way around would be the case, too. If you, if you picked up a, a reference book 
but you thought that it was a fiction novel and you started reading it and you say, well, this is just boring. I don't know what this is all about. It's just absolutely boring, right? So we, you have to know what type of a book you're dealing with, right? If it's a reference book, you have to read it like a reference book. If it's a book of poetry, you have to read it like a book of poetry. If it's a, a novel, you have to read it like a novel. If it's a, a biography, you have to read it like a biography, right? If you don't read it the way that it's written, if, if you don't read it like the, the proper genre, then you're going to be confused, right? You're going to think that it's more complicated than it really is, right? Uh, an encyclopedia or a dictionary or a thesaurus, it's not a complicated book, is it? I mean, there's some complicated things in it. I can't pronounce everything that's in it, but if you know what it is, it's not complicated. It's pretty simple what it is, right? A thesaurus tells you the different words that all mean the same thing. So a thesaurus and explaining what it is is pretty simple. But if you read it like a novel, well, then it becomes complicated and it becomes something that it's not intended to be. So when we now take that conversation to the Bible, well, how do we classify the Bible? What, what things do we need to know about Scripture? Okay, that it's inspired. Absolutely, we need to know that it's inspired. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> That's the tough part, isn't it? That's the tough part, absolutely. What else? Now, now here's something that, that some people don't stop. It, it's a simple thing, really, but some people don't stop to think about. Now, is the Bible a book? Sometimes we say the good book. It's like the good book always says, right? Well, is it a book? Kind of, right? I mean, it, it's, it's in one binding most of the time, but really it's 66 books, isn't it? Really, I like to, when I'm explaining the Bible to somebody who's not really familiar with it, I like to say it's a library. I like to say, picture it like a library, because that kind of helps us to get the right mindset about it. Because you've got books in the Bible that are books of poetry, right? Like what? Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Job. So we, we've, got, we've got these books that are, that are books of poetry, and you can't read those books like you read the book of Philippians, right? Because that's a letter, right? And so you have to read those books differently. So understanding, first of all, that the Bible is a library of books. That it is 66 different books written over a long period of time, 14, 1500 years, and all organized by the genre of book that they are. So it's a small library, but it's a library nonetheless. And so sometimes if we think the Bible is a book rather than a collection of books, well, we're jumping in at the wrong place, right? And we're going to have a tendency to read all the books the same way. So somebody gets to a long list of genealogies, and they say, well, that's kind of boring, right? I, I don't know, I have long names, I don't know how to pronounce them. What's that all about? What does that have to do with my life? How does that apply to my life? See, sometimes I think that we read the Bible, we read the Bible sometimes like the, like the whole thing is an encyclopedia, like it's a reference book. In fact, our Bibles are kind of laid out that kind of lends to that idea, right? With the, the chapter numbers and the, the verse numbers. And, and we have a tendency to look at the concordance and say, well, what does the Bible say about X? And so we'll look in the concordance and then we'll, we'll jump over to a chapter and verse. Now, now, we probably understand that when the Bible was written, when each of those letters or books were written, did they have those verse numbers in there? No, we added that later, right? Because it, it makes it easier for us to find a certain section. But, but when the, the church at Rome, for instance, got the book of Romans, did they, did they say, okay, let's start in chapter 6 and verse 7? Is that how they read it? No, they read it like you read a letter, right? I mean, they started in the beginning, and they read it through. And they probably read it through again and again. They copied it. They sent it to other people. But they read it as a, as a letter. But, but we have a tendency to treat the, the book of Romans not like a letter, but we have a tendency to treat it like we would an encyclopedia or a dictionary, or some other type of reference book, rather than a letter. So understanding that the Bible isn't an encyclopedia, although it's kind of laid out like a reference book, that's an important thing to understand, isn't it? Sometimes we treat the Bible like a self-help book, right? Like it's about my own personal happiness, right? And, and so we, we treat it like it's a self-help book, or like it's a, a book for, for me personally. Well, was the Bible written to me personally? No, it really wasn't, right? I mean, it was written to other people over lots of time. Now, it has application to me, 
and I need to understand what the application is, but first I need to understand who wrote it and to whom did they write it and why did they write it. We'll talk about that in just a second. But sometimes we have a tendency to treat it like that. Sometimes we have a tendency to treat it like it's just a, a hodgepodge of stories with all, all good morals and, and, and teaches you good morals and good manners and this is how you're supposed to live and, and so I need to be like Abraham or I need to be like Isaac or I need to be like Joseph or I need to be like Daniel. But, but sometimes we forget that really when you put all the books together it really tells one big long story, doesn't it? One of the things that I loved about going to the Bolivar congregation where Kevin preached before was that in their auditorium they had a timeline on the wall. And I thought, man, that's so important for the church to understand the timeline of events, right? Because if you don't understand, if you don't understand how Joseph ended up causing the, the children of Israel to be in Egypt in the first place, then you don't really understand why Moses had to lead them out a few hundred years later, right? And so if you understand how the things happen in sequence of events, that's important to understanding the Bible, isn't it? Otherwise, we treat it kind of like it's Aesop's fables or something. You know what I'm talking about? We read a story and we say, what's the moral of that story? Like it's just a standalone story all by itself. And so sometimes we have a tendency to do that. Sometimes we have a tendency to treat it like it's just a devotional book, like full of insp inspirational sayings and little things we could pull out of it and, and put on a bumper sticker or put on a, you know, a little motivational poster in our office or something like that. When really, you know, there may be some, some things that are really powerful, but but taken as a whole, that's really not the best way to read the Bible, is it? Just open up to a passage and hope that it, it makes your day and not understanding what the bigger picture is. So let's talk about that bigger picture. And, and I tried to say, okay, if I had one sentence, and there could be lots of sentences that we could, we could decide on and we could talk about that could help us to get this framework. But if we had one sentence, this would be my sentence to, to say this is what Scripture is. Maybe. You guys weren't kidding, were you? Okay, yeah, you're going to have to do it. Okay, so this would, be my, this would be my sentence, that Scripture is the library, that's what we talked about earlier, right? The library of prophetic books, that's what we're talking about, about the inspiration, right? And we'll talk about that more in just a second. We'll explain all of this, but Scripture is the library of prophetic books about, and this is important too, isn't it? Understanding what the Bible is about. It's about God and his chosen people. That's what the Bible's about. It is about God and his chosen people. We'll talk about that in a second. But scripture is the library of prophetic books about God and his chosen people. That would be my sentence, and you could have your sentence on what the Bible is about, but, but I think that this will help us to, to build a framework so that in this context, things begin to make sense. The, the, the parts of the whole begin to make better sense. And when we understand this, I think we'll understand Scripture a little bit better. So let's look at a couple passages of Scripture to talk about this idea of the library of prophetic books. So the next slide, if you would. For 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. This is what Peter says. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Now, it's funny that one of the few verses that uses the word in interpretation is often misinterpreted. But Peter is talking about where Scripture comes from, right? He's talking about the fact that it's not a, a, the prophet's own explanation of things. It's not the prophet looking at the world or looking at God or looking at people and saying, this is what's going on, and this is what I think. It's not about his opinions, is it? It's not his own interpretation of the events. Scripture comes from prophets, verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Scripture is a collection or a library of books that were written by prophets, right? What's a prophet? Somebody who speaks for God, right? Somebody that God has, has given the Holy Spirit to, carried them along, Peter says. Carried them along as they preached or wrote their message. And that's what the Bible is. And scripture, every single book of Scripture, all 66 books, were written by prophets. They were written by men that were carried along by the Holy Spirit in order to, to give that particular message to the people of their time, right? And so that's, uh, look, at, look at the next passage, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. This is what Paul writes to Timothy. Saying, all scripture is 
The ESV reads, breathed out by God. Some of the other translations says, inspired. Now, inspired means, it has that idea of the breath of God. The, the Greek word is uh, theopneustos, the, theopneustos. And, and it's, a, it's a unique word that doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible. But it's, a, it's an adjective. It's a describing word. You know how Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says about Scripture that, that God's word is living and active? So those are words that describe it. Not necessarily where it came from, although this is implied in this statement, but theopneustos, or that idea of inspired, means that it has God's breath in it. That it's living because it has the breath of God in it. That all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. How much of scripture can be described by that that word inspired or breathed out by God? How much of it? All of it, right? From beginning to end, every book, all 66 books are inspired by God. They all have God's breath in them. They are living and active so that the man of God may be fully, completely equipped for every good work, right? And so... All 66 books of this small little library are prophetic, right? They are from God. And we need to understand that. We need to understand that every one of them have a human author, right? That was carried along by the Holy Spirit and that wrote at a specific time to a specific people for a specific purpose, right? But what's interesting about it? I mean, what's, you know, I've been thinking about this for the last couple of weeks. Think about this for a second. Why, why, just pick a book of the Bible, Genesis or Jeremiah or Lamentations. Do all of those books, I, every single book, do, does it all have its immediate historic context? I mean, the, 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 the prophet was writing to a specific people for a specific purpose at a specific time, right? But the books of the Old Testament, they kept them, didn't they? They not only recorded them, or the prophet recorded them, but they kept them, they preserved them, they passed them on to future generations. What does that tell us? What does that tell us? What's that? They're important? Yeah. What else? It's what God wanted, absolutely. And it had application to future generations, right? To future generations. That's important, isn't it? Because we need to understand, this is what Jeremiah was saying to the people of his day, But the Jews preserved it and passed it on to future generations because they knew that God wanted his people to understand that same message in future generations. I mean, think about this for a second. Most of the things that, everything rather, that that Moses wrote about in the book of Genesis, it had taken place long, 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 hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, some of it, before Moses even came onto the scene, right? Right? Why, why did, why did the people need the book of Genesis? Why did the people of Moses' day that were coming out of Egypt in the Exodus, why did they need the book of Genesis? Read them to Abraham and what happened before they came from. Absolutely, because they needed us to understand where they came from, right? And the promises that God had made to Abraham, why? Because those were their promises, right? And that takes us to the next point. That that's really what the Bible is about. The Bible is about God and his chosen people, right? God and his chosen people. Now, in the Old Testament, who is that? The Jews, right? The the Hebrews, the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, right? So you have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes, and then they they go off into Egyptian, uh, Egyptian bondage for several hundred years, and then Moses brings them out. But it's about God and his people. It's about God and his chosen people. We don't always read it that way. And I know that's a simple thing, but we have to remember that. We have to remember that's what the book of Genesis was for. It was to inform, teach, equip, admonish all of these wonderful things, the people of God as they began their journey with God. So let's talk about that idea of of God's chosen people. Amos chapter 3 and verse 2 says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Isn't it pretty amazing? And I know for some of us this is simple and and, and, and basic, but isn't that pretty amazing? That God picked Abraham and said, you and your family will become my people. 
my chosen people. And I'm going to give you a law to follow. I'm going to give you circumcision as a sign that you are my people. I'm going to give promises to you about land and people. And then this really special promise, right? That all nations will be blessed through Abraham's seed, right? Now, they don't really understand what that means, and they kind of forget about it, it seems, for a long time, that really their purpose was to be a blessing to all nations. But isn't that amazing? I mean, just stop and think about that. I get excited about this stuff. I mean, it's exciting, isn't it? That God would say, I'm going to pick one people to be my people. Did, he ha did God have to pick any people? Sometimes we think, we think God has to be fair. Well, what would fair be? Fair would be at, um, you know, at the flood... That God wiped out all people, right? That God just wiped out everybody and said, that's it, I'm done with these people. But instead he picked a family, didn't he? He picked Noah and his family to bless. Why? What did he find in Noah? Righteousness, right? He walked by faith, right? He knew who God was. He trusted God. He believed God. He obeyed God. And because of the faith of Noah, he, he picked him, he chose him, he, 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 he blessed him with grace. He chose his family to save and to bless. And then God kept on choosing a family, choosing a people to bless. And so when we get to Abraham, it's pretty amazing. God didn't have to choose Abraham. God didn't have, have to choose anybody, but he had a plan, didn't he? And we see the big picture of the plan because here we are in the church. But, but if we could just step out of it for just a second and realize how amazing that is, that God chose a people and said, of all the families of the earth, I'm going to pick you and you're going to be my people. Yes, sir. Righteousness is one of popularity concepts. Right. Uh, Noah was also a preacher of righteousness for 150 years. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. Great point. Look at, look at Leviticus chapter 26. This will be the next slide. But what did, what did they do? Verse 3 says, If you walk, this is God talking to his people, if you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, I will make my dwelling place, verses 11 and 12, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you and I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. That's amazing, isn't it? That God says, I will make my dwelling among you. You will be my people. I will dwell with you. I will walk with you. Isn't that amazing? That God picked a people to walk with. That God picked a people to dwell with. And God said, you're going to be my people. Now, we understand, don't we? If we read the whole law and we read the Old Testament, we understand that others could even come into that people, right? They could be circumcised and come into the people of God. But God gave this special sign that if a person was circumcised and, and they followed the law, they could be his people and he would dwell among them. Now, how could a holy God dwell among a sinful people? That's what the book of Leviticus is all about, right? God gave them this, this, this covenant and he gave them this means of the sacrificial system so that their sins could be removed from them and he could dwell among them. But that was just a temporary situation, wasn't it? And we understand, again, we understand the bigger picture, hopefully. But, but again, let's just stop for a moment and admire the beauty of that. That God picked this people and said, you'll be my people. Now, now the people, as they went along, they had to have this. Didn't they? they had to have this scripture, this prophetic writing of previous generations so that they would know what it meant to be a covenant people, so that they would know what it meant to have a God who dwells with them and who walks with them, who forgives their iniquities so that he can walk with them to, to be righteous, to be faithful. Now, did they always do that? No, more often than not, they didn't do that, did they? But again, let, let's stop and think about this for a second. Now, when we read, what are some of our favorite, quote-unquote, Bible stories? What are some of our favorite Old Testament Bible stories? What do we teach the kids? What have we grown up hearing? What are some of our stories we like? Joseph. Joseph. Man, I love the story of Joseph, don't you? Okay, so we have Joseph, and who else? Daniel. Daniel. Daniel we say Daniel in the lion's den, right? Or Daniel, we have several stories about Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. David and Goliath. I mean, that's one that the world knows, right? Anytime that there's a situation where there's a little guy taking on a big guy or a big corporation or something like that, we say this is a David and Goliath type situation. And we have a tendency to so 
I don't know, oversimplify things, that we think that that's what the story's about. The story's about that, that you, can, you can conquer big things if you just, you know, trust God or something like that. Well, really the story's about God and his people, right? The story is about the fact that David was who he was supposed to be, right? Could all of God's people have been giant slayers had they put their trust in God and walked with him? Yes. That was the promise before they went into the promised land. That's what Deuteronomy is all about. It's this reminder of the law. Right before, you know, they had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and a whole generation had died off. And so Deuteronomy is this reminder that says, okay, when you go in, you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy the people before you because you're my people. I mean, when you're God's people, when, when God is your God, when you are on God's side, and God says, I will take care of you, I will deliver you, I will save you, I will give you the things that I've promised to you, you should have such great confidence, not self-confidence, but God confidence, right? Where you can go in, you can march in, and you can do whatever he says. And he said some pretty bizarre things, right? Like what? What's the first, the first thing that they do? Jericho, right? What does he say to do? Walk around the wall? I mean, that's just strange, isn't it? But it's a reminder to God and his people. Listen, all you have to do is show up for the battle. I'll win the war for you. And that's what David is about. Isn't that what David and Goliath is about? It's about the fact that they all should have been giant slayers. God told them, listen, if you go in, one of you will chase five of them. It doesn't matter how big they are. Why is it that they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years? Disbelief. Disbelief. What were they afraid of? The giants in the land, right? They were afraid of the big old people in there. They got big cities, they're big people, they're strong, they're fortified. We can't take them. What do you mean we can't take them? Who are we? We're God's people. And that was David's message, wasn't it? As he shows up, this shepherd boy shows up on the battlefield, and you have God's army cowering before this giant, this Philistine, this uncircumcised one. God's not with him, God's with us. And here you are cowering in the shadows. Go out there and take care of this. God is our God. Yes, sir. My yeah. God did it. They didn't have to do nothing. Right. And they walked in with good people, lived their houses, they mm -hmm. did everything. They came back and they just moved. See God's people moved to every house. God provided. Mm -hmm. and, and why is it that there were still Philistines in the land? Why is it that we get all the way to David and there's still Philistines there? Disbelief, right? Disobedience. A lack of faithfulness. And so we have a tendency to read these stories and read them and put ourselves in the shoes of the hero, right? When really, I try to encourage people, when you read the stories like David and Goliath, when you read Jeremiah, when you read Lamentations, when you read Isaiah, when you read any of the, when you read the book of Genesis, don't put yourself in the shoes of the main characters. Put, your shoes in, put yourself in the shoes of, I always say Bob the Israelite, I don't think Bob is an Israelite name, but you know, you, just some random Israelite. Just some random guy, because that's how they would read it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, right? This is the story of my people. Not my people, but God's people. And this is what it looks like to be God's people. This is what it looks like to be disobedient to God. This is, these are the consequences when we don't walk with God in faithfulness. Now, the people broke the covenant, right? Jeremiah 11 and verse 10. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I have made with their fathers. Now, now when a people breaks a, a covenant, what could God have done? Whatever he wanted, right? He wasn't obligated to keep forgiving them and keep forgiving them and keep letting them stay in the land. Of course, they would drive them out. They'd be in captivity. He'd bring them back. He'd, the foreign powers would rise up against them. They'd be oppressed and they'd cry out to God. Okay, God, we want to be your people again. And isn't that the problem that they always had? They didn't want to be God's people. They wanted to be other people. They wanted to be Gentiles, right? I, 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 we want a king like the Gentiles have. We, we want idols like the Gentiles have. Why would you want an idol? Well, that, that's a cool God, right? I mean, you can see their God. I mean, it's, it's made out of gold. It's pretty. And, you know, I can set it on a shelf or I can bow before it. I mean, that, they've got cool gods. You can't see our God. We want one of their gods. Well, how's that working out for you? Right? And they want to be like Gentiles. And God says, okay, see what it's like to be like a Gentile for a while. See what happens. 
And so over and over and over and over and over and over again, God sends his prophets to remind them, this is who you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be my people. They get driven off into captivity, like in Babylon, right? God sends Jeremiah. Here's one of the most abused texts in Scripture, and it drives me crazy. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. We, we, we put it on posters and motivational statements. We put it in graduation cards. I know the plans I have for you, plans to, to prosper you and not to harm you. Now, we try to individualize that like it's about me, right? God has plans for my life. God's going to bless me. I'm going to have a big house and a nice car and, and a big retirement fund. And that's not what it's about, is it? What's Jeremiah saying? Jeremiah is, saying, Jeremiah is saying that though God is punishing you, though you're being disciplined for a short time, God's going to bring you back to the land because he's not done with you yet. Even though you've broken the covenant, even though you've sinned against God, even though you've walked in disobedience and unfaithfulness, God is not done with you yet. He still has a plan for you. And then we realize now, sitting on this side of the cross, what that plan was, right? What God's plan always was with his people was to bring his son into the world, right? Was to, to bring Jesus, the Messiah, the, the seed of Abraham. That's why Matthew begins his gospel account by saying what? This is the genealogy of Jesus, right? The son of David, the king, the son of Abraham, the patriarch. And when we understand that that's what the whole Old Testament is about, the whole Old Testament is God dealing with his people. Then we can take it and make application to us today, can't we? If we understand that. Now, if we think that it's just a bunch of inspirational sayings or a bunch of uh, uh, like Aesop's fables kind of stories, it's just a hodgepodge of different stories uh, put in with a little bit of genealogy that bores us to death. But if we understand that it's about God and his people, we understand the importance of the genealogy, don't we? Even if we can't pronounce all the names, I can't pronounce all the names either. But we understand the importance of that because that's what it's about. It's about God and his chosen people. So let's, let's move on to Jesus for just a minute. Let's think about Christ. So the, the Jews were unfaithful to the covenant, but God remained faithful because God still had a plan. He wasn't done with them yet. And finally, he sent his son. Look at John 1. This will be up on the screen. John 1. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep reading here in just a second. John 1. Let's read verses 1 through 5. Probably a text most of us are familiar with. But this is how John begins his gospel account, right? And we understand that that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this is the culmination of everything, right? Of God dealing with his people. And finally, this righteous branch has sprouted up from Judah. Finally, this righteous one has come, the anointed one, the very son of God. Let's read John 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, that's not saying was God as in past tense, but it's saying that the, in the beginning, God, the word was God and continues to be God. The word is God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's look down at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. What well, John is that? John the baptizer, right? Verse 7, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which, shot, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. What people is that? The Jews, right? That's what it's all about. So everything has been leading up to, right? That finally, the one that has been promised all along, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the son of, of David, the, the, the seed of Abraham, has come into the world and he's come to his own people. The people that God chose, his, his holy chosen people. And he came to his own, but like the prophets before him, they did not receive him, right? They didn't listen to him. What did they do? They nailed him to a cross, right? They utterly and totally rejected him. Verse 12. But to all, <laughs> I like that word, don't you? But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, are we still talking about God and his people? Yes. But now we're opening up a whole new door, aren't we? Through Jesus, a whole new way has been opened up. A new kingdom has been established. One in which it doesn't matter what family you come from. It doesn't matter how you were born into the world. What matters is what? What does it say? Verse, verse 12. What's that? Obedience. Obedience. But to all who did receive him, who's him? Jesus. All who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God's children. God's family. That's right. It's our choice. Not by who, how we've been born into the world anymore, but through Christ, now all can become God's children. I like what John says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. You see what kind of love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? And as we read through the Old Testament, we think, wow, how blessed, how exciting, how wonderful it must have been to be God's children to be God's family, to be God's chosen people, how they squandered the blessings that were given to them. And then we keep reading into the gospel accounts and we say, whoa, whoa. Now I, a Gentile, can become one of the children of God. Now I can be part of the holy chosen people. That's what the New Testament is about, isn't it? How we've gone from just the Jews, how we've gone from this circumcised group of people in this one region to now all nations of all mankind, all over the world, whoever would receive Christ, whoever would become a Christian, a disciple of his, can become a part of the family of God. And that's the Great Commission, isn't it? At the end of Matthew, at the end of Mark, Jesus tells them to go and tell the good news, right? And whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that's what it is to be saved, right? That's what it is to be forgiven. The same thing that it was to be. What was the purpose of forgiveness in the Old Testament? So that God could what? Walk with them. Dwell with them. Have fellowship with them. That's what our forgiveness is about too. Not just, and we'll talk more about this this week, but not just so we can go to heaven when we die, but so that we can have fellowship with God now. I don't know about you, but that excites me to my very core. I can't hardly stand it to, to think about how wonderful that is. That we get to become children of God. And that's what the New Testament is about. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. And this is the battle that Paul continually fought, right? For, the, for those of the circumcision, for those who were Jews in the flesh, to finally give it up and to realize it's not about the flesh. It's about faith in Jesus Christ. It's about discipleship. It's about following Christ. It's about being baptized into Christ and walking faithfully with him. Look at Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Oh, isn't that wonderful? We get to be, now why does he say sons of God? Now the women might say, well, why does he say sons of God? I'm not a son. Yes, you are. You're a son, not a daughter. Because under, under that law system, who got the inheritance? The sons. So in a legal sense, you get to become sons of God. Now, now we're, not talking about, we're not talking about male and female. We're talking about inheritance here. You get to become an heir of the promises of God. And that, isn't that what Paul's talking about? For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You've clothed yourselves with him. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. That's exciting, isn't it? And that's what Paul's letters are all about. How do we continue to be, or become, remain, abide, as the family of God, as the people of God, as the children of God. When I individualize everything and I make it about Wes, instead of about Wes's role and Wes's responsibility as a part of the people of God, I miss the point, don't I? When I make it about me rather than about us, I miss the point. But scripture is all about being the prophetic library of books about God and his chosen people. And I am so thankful that Christ has come, 
that you and I might be children of God, that we might be a part of the chosen people. Thank y'all.